Howdy mates, good afternoon, how are we all doing? It is Wednesday, March 8th, 2023, and before I get further into this video, it marks, today marks a special day for two different reasons. One, it is actually my mother's birthday, she turns 51 years young, and then for another, I came to recently discover that March 8th also marks International Women's Day as a way to basically respect women. I mean, I believe that is the basis of the day. And to me, that's quite poetic. Just to think that both of those fall on the same day. So that really made me happy to hear. But anyways... I'm actually at a revisit at the uh, Red Bug Slough Preserve up in Sarasota. And, huh, we're actually getting a little bit of a sprinkle. That's odd, given that, you know, we don't really get that this time of year. Anyway, where I'm basically walking that you're seeing is, you know, you have your wetland pond. And to my left... And, of course, my right. We've also got littoral zones. Now, I know I've mentioned about littoral zones before. But, I figured it wouldn't hurt to brush up on it. So, a littoral zone basically marks a transition between a body of water and the mainland that, we're, that I'm walking on right now. But typically, a littoral zone is broken up into three different parts. You have your submergent plants, which involve plants that basically grow underwater. So you can't directly see them. And a great example of a submergent plant is the bladderwort, which, by the way, is a really neat plant given that it is a carnivorous one. So they produce their flower that you can see just above the water, but the rest of the plant is all underneath. And the bladderwort produces all of these several distinctive pods. That's the best way I can describe it. But these pods, they're basically like an extension of their digestive system. So these pods essentially take in mosquito larvae as a way to control their population. And it's a natural one at that. So that's even an extra bonus. So just after submergent, you've got water floating plants. So you can actually see some of it in our uh, little wetland right here, our little pond. Uh, you can see the water lilies. So, essentially their root is still underwater, but the actual bloom of the plant can be above water. And then last but not least, you also have emergent vegetation. A great example uh, is actually right here. You see like those uh, lance-shaped leaves? Those are known as pickerel weeds. Now, typically when they're blooming, they actually have these uh, purple flowers that kind of have a rachim arrangement. So, essentially what that means when they're emergent is part of their root is underwater, but most of their body is above water. So, and then of course... We've also got our molly grass right here. They're not quite in bloom right now, but when they are, they usually have these pinkish purple feather looking seeds. So the first question that really comes to mind, you know, in me discussing this is why should we really care? Well, here we go. Oh, no way. Rosate spoonbills? Sorry, got a little distracted there. I've never seen rosate spoonbills here before. 
Uh, okay, yes. So why are they important? So for one thing, these littoral zones, they literally act as a buffer. So, in other words, when it gets into the wet season and it starts raining a lot, these littoral zones can actually slow down the amount of flooding that happens in these waterways. Because you figure a lot of these plants that are in these zones, they need water. And the best part about native plants in particular is they have a deeper established root than, say, a non-native. So that's why, of course, shout out to Elizabeth Clark, because she recently opened up her nursery. We need native plants because they have that capability to survive here just fine. They don't require much maintenance, at least throughout its life, anyways. Usually upon, you know, the beginning of its life, it's different. But anyways, you know, they produce that deeper taproot system. And that's what's so remarkable about it. You know, like salt bush right in front of us is a great example. For another, they can act as a shelter for our wildlife. You know, whether it be wading birds, reptiles, amphibians. And a food source, too, in addition. So not just shelter, but also a food source. And most importantly, you know how just a couple of days ago when I was talking a little bit about the red tide, of course, and how nutrients can leach into the waterways, there is a particular term that is known as the cation exchange capacity, which I've mentioned about before. And what that really entails, in summary, is it's really, it's a soil's ability to carry cations in the soil. So, some great examples of cations include uh, magnesium, for example, and even potassium. But then... You also have anions that are in the soil, too. Typically, these anions are our most famously described nutrients, which include, but not limited to, nitrates and phosphates. So the thing is, when the amount of... And typically, these anions are organic compounds. So the thing is... Hold on just a second. Okay, back at it. I had to pass through a group that was coming by. So, essentially, when the amount of organic compounds exceed the amount of cations that are in the soil, because, you know, negative and positive, opposites react and they attract. When that is exceeded, you will have leaching as a result. So like when we use excessive fertilizers or you know excessive uh, mining which I talked about just the other day or uh, among other variables too you know pet waste you know you're going to have an excess of nutrient pollution and as a result, that gives rise to, of course, eutrophication and our harmful algal blooms, such as that of the red tide. But here's the thing. When you have more of these littoral zones, you know, whether it be on your property, commercial property, or even park property, you are contributing to a better cause. Because, you know, these plants need those nutrients. And so, when you have a littoral zone, you're already mitigating 
the chance of nutrient pollution. And I think that's really the point of this video is, you know, we need a little less of green lawns. I know I'm being rather direct about it, but I'm just saying, you know, that's, of course, one of many causes. But littoral zones are a great solution. And so I am going to say this. Those of you who may have, like, connections to... Uh, other nurseries or of course even some gardening programs I'd love to learn more about them just because I feel like I could use more time to develop more of my green thumb because I I really do miss doing it as often as I used to I think ever since I moved to Florida I guess I just never really had the chance that much you know, between work, especially, which is overrated sometimes. So, all right, you guys, take care. Enjoy your Wednesday. Journey on a journey is onwards. Take care, folks. See ya.